He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. When I was a kid growing up in Hamilton, there was a fountain I used to like to play in. It was next to the centre place mall, so mum and dad would take me there when they went shopping. Recently, I saw that fountain in the news. Yeah. Applause as the statue of John Hamilton was carted off this morning. It was notably gentle and controlled compared to the fate of other colonial era statues around the world. Some slave traders and invaders. When I saw this report, I was confused. That statue of Captain Hamilton was standing right next to the fountain I used to play in. But I couldn't remember it. Captain Hamilton died leading the British forces in the Battle of Gate Pa in 1864, regarded as one of the most important battles of the New Zealand wars. Local man Kip Ormsby says the statue needs to be removed from the public space because it represents a painful time in history for Māori. I just believe it should go. Um, yes, it is a part of history, but it's for uh, Māori people, it's not a good part of history. So why are we glorifying it for Māori people to see that every day? And... It turned out I was right to be confused. That statue was only erected in 2013, and by that time I was a bit too old to get away with playing in public fountains. Captain Hamilton's a bit of an oddity as far as statues of colonial figures go. His monument has only been standing for seven years. But he's become an emblem of a wider debate about what these statues represent and what should happen to them now. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. It's been a long time since our last episode. I've been busy on all kinds of other podcast projects. You might have noticed last year I teamed up with Lee Marama McLaughlin for the Aotearoa History Show. More recently, I also helped produce The Service, which is a fascinating series on New Zealand's role in the Cold War. If you haven't checked out either of those podcasts, you really should. But anyway, our timing's kind of worked out perfectly. As long-term listeners know, this podcast is all about the shady, controversial and sometimes downright villainous figures from history. And right now, a lot of those figures are facing a reckoning in New Zealand and all over the world. Welcome back to CBS This Morning. This is a look at workers removing the Johnny Reb statue this morning that sat on top of an 80-foot Confederate monument in downtown Norfolk, Virginia. On Tuesday in Richmond, one of Christopher Columbus was toppled and dragged into a lake. Another Columbus statue met a similar fate in Minnesota. In Belgium, statues of Leopold II have been brought down. He was a king whose actions in modern-day Democratic Republic of Congo are considered crimes against humanity. Two women have been charged over the vandalism of the Captain Cook statue in Hyde Park. One, an employee... Cast in bronze, now daubed with graffiti. One of Bristol's most famous sons. This had begun as a Black Lives Matter demonstration, but it ended in the historic docks where Colston's ships once sailed. We're going to get back to the individual stories of shady New Zealanders next episode, but first we're diving into the history of these statues and the questions of what should happen to them. You can't talk about statues in New Zealand without talking to Jock Phillips, former chief historian for the Ministry of Culture and Heritage and author of the book New Zealand's War Memorials. I started taking photographs of uh, war memorials thinking that we could make a nice calendar out of it. (laughs) It was taking the photographs that then led me to really look closely and I got hooked. I got, I got uh, Ken Inglis, who, who was the great historian of Australian war memorials, said, you get a war memorial disease, <laughs> you get hooked. I've had a statue in war memorial disease now for 30 years. And my kids, uh, when, I, when I had young kids, they would sort of roll their eyes when I, <laughs> we came into a small town and Dad would rush off to find the closest piece of phallic marble statue, phallic marble, <laughs> piece of marble that he could find. New Zealand's first war memorial sits in the Mōtō Gardens in Whanganui. 
The gardens were the site of a major protest over Māori land rights in 1995. The Māori, the ten mayors of the world and who else, who are sitting in Whanganui, pretending they are somebody important. The rest of New Zealand knows it is an illegal occupation. The rest of... The monument's quite beautiful. All white marble topped with a statue of a weeping woman. Which I always think is actually very appropriate for a war memorial because it refers, of course, to the the mothers who lost their sons. But if you look below that statue, there are words engraved in te reo Māori and in English. They read, To the memory of those brave men who fell at Motor 14 May 1864, in defence of law and order against fanaticism and barbarism. This monument was erected right in the middle of the New Zealand Wars. Followers of the Ringatū and Pai Māori their faiths were fighting a guerrilla campaign to stop settlers taking Māori land and extending British rule over them. Those are the barbarian fanatics the statue's referring to. The words, are, when you see them, they, 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 they shock you deeply. They were particularly shocking to Mark Twain, the famous American author. He visited New Zealand as part of a trip around the world in the 1890s and wrote a book about what he saw. He had this to say about the use of the word fanatic on the Mōtua monument. It is right to praise these brave white men who fell in the Māori War. They deserve it. But the presence of that word detracts from the dignity of their cause and their deeds and makes them appear to have spilt their blood in a conflict with ignoble men, men not worthy of that costly sacrifice. But the men were worthy. It was no shame to fight them. But Mark Twain missed something important about this monument. It wasn't put up in honour of white settlers. It was erected in honour of Māori. That memorial was put up by the citizens of Whanganui, the, the European citizens of Whanganui, who were, had been really terrified in 1864 um, when Pai Māori, upriver Māori, were coming down the river, and there was a wide expectation that Whanganui was going to be attacked. And some of the Māori in the lower river, around Pūtiki, people who had been closely involved in the economy of Whanganui, volunteered to go and defend Whanganui. And there was a famous battle at Mutaua, which was an island in the middle of the Whanganui River. And basically it was a bit like a sort of football match. They, They sort of drew a line down the middle of the island and the upriver Māori and the lower river Māori took sides and there was a fierce battle. I think it lasted about uh, uh, an hour and a half and in the process, 14 of the lower river Māori were killed. So immediately after the battle, the uh, community got together and they decided to do two things. The women decided that they would um, sew a memorial flag, the Mutua flag, and uh, they would give it to the local Putiki Māori, and they also decided that they would put up a memorial to the gallant Māori who had defended Whanganui. But the motive behind this memorial wasn't just sheer gratitude from the settlers. One of the politicians who argued in favour of the monument was William Featherston, superintendent of the Wellington Provincial Council. The statue will act on the natives as the Victoria Cross on the British troops. It will, in fact, be to them a Victoria Cross. It will, I am convinced, stimulate the natives who are about to accompany the gallant forces, imperial and colonial, under General Shute on an expedition against the treacherous, plundering, murdering tribes on the West Coast to still greater deeds of valour. And if you read the speeches at the at the unveiling... Um, it, they're, they're particularly addressed to Māori from other areas who are being called upon to fight Takuti and Titikawaru to recognise that, you know, Pākehā appreciate their services. So it was a piece of propaganda. It was designed to shore up, you know, 
the, 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 the loyal Māori, the kūpapa Māori at the time. Because the wars were still going on at the yeah, time. Yeah, there, there was still Tita Kawaru was, was uh, at that time, um, you know, was coming down the, the, the west coast. And on the far east coast, you know, Te Kōti was, 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 remained a, a major threat. So, yeah, absolutely, the wars were still on and ma- much of the wars were being fought by Māori loyal to the crown. Now, we should say Mark Twain didn't get it totally wrong when he was talking about the Mōutō monument. He actually misremembered and thought there were two monuments, one to white settlers who died in the New Zealand wars and another to Māori who fought alongside them. In reality, only the second monument actually exists, but Twain thought this monument to Kūpapa Māori was even more problematic. It is an object lesson to the rising generation. It invites treachery, disloyalty, unpatriotism. Its lesson, in frank terms, is desert your flag, slay your people, burn their homes, shame your nationality. We honour such. He went on to say the statue could only be remedied with dynamite. Of course, Mark Twain was coming at this as a complete outsider. He doesn't seem to have asked any local Māori how they felt. Chris Shenton is a descendant of some of the Māori honoured by this monument. He spoke to RNZ's Justin Gregory about it in 2011. I'm a uh, descendant of the local iwi in Whanganui, um, Te Ateo Nui a Paparangi. I'm also a descendant of uh, Metakingi Tarangi Paitai, who was involved in the Battle of Motor, and uh, also uh, a direct descendant of um, Heremia Tarangi Takaku, who's on the, named on the monument itself as he was killed in the Battle of Motor. I kind of ignore the fanaticism, barbarism, and look at it and just sense that, you know, that was the context of the times. I, I know, I have been told by an uncle who's passed on now that um, he understood that he, and he was told by our, you know, grandparents, grandfather and further back that there was some reluctance by our family to, to participate in the monument when it was opened and things like that. Um, that's just oral history within our family. I don't know if it was if it's entirely correct, but you know, um, and I, that could be partially to do with the language and that the other uh, deceased were not commemorated on the monument. After the New Zealand Wars ended, there were several other monuments and statues erected in honour of Kupapa Māori, Māori who fought for the government. For example, the Mōutua Gardens is also home to a large statue of Te Kipa Te Rangi Hiwinui, also known as Major Kemp one of the most famous kūpapa leaders. Tom Roa is a member of Ngāti Maniapoto and an associate professor of Māori studies at Waikato University. His ancestors fought against the colonial forces and their Māori allies in the Waikato Wars, but he doesn't want to see monuments to kūpapa torn down. The Māori word for enemy is hua didi, and hua means friend. Didi means angry, so he, he's my angry friend at this time. But that doesn't mean that in the future or in the past uh, we weren't friends, we can be friends in the future. That, that kind of a, um, philosophy, perhaps, is part of the allowing the statues of Kupapa Māori to stand. But there are other monuments Tom Roa finds harder to live with. One stands in the Auckland suburb of Otahuhu. It honours Colonel Marmaduke Nixon, who led the Colonial Defence Force Cavalry during the Waikato War. It was erected in 1865, shortly after his death. Jock Phillips says Nixon was singled out for a memorial mostly for political reasons. During the New Zealand Wars, much of the fighting was done by British soldiers, and uh, Nixon was one of those local heroes, you know, someone who helped organise the local militia, and I think that was the sort of motivation. Let's have a let's have a local boy here represented. Um, you know, it's it is highly questionable because um, you know Nixon was pretty heavily responsible for um, some pretty atrocious acts at Rangiafia, um in the Waikato, uh, you know, a place that 
this general agreement had been decided to be set aside and wouldn't be attacked. It would be it was largely a refuge for women and and old people and children, and um, it was it was regarded as being a place where uh, you know the crops were grown and a place of peace. Colonel Nixon led the attack of Rangiaufia. He was shot in the chest trying to storm a fare. That fare then caught fire and troops shot some of the Māori who tried to escape. Those who stayed inside were burned to death, including women and children. Nixon himself died from his wounds three months later. Tom Roa says his memorial is deeply troubling for Waikato Māori. For many of us of Ngāti Apukura, he was a jackbooted Nazi who booted down the house in an undefended village and the uh, lady inside uh, had, had a gun. So when you have a gun and somebody boots down your house, you defend yourself. Y- yet that m- memorial talks about his acting in the defence of New Zealand. Uh, nothing is said about the lady who was acting in defence of her home, her life, her children, the way that we we remember. And why we remember needs to be carefully and clearly uh, better articulated. The Mōtua and Nixon monuments are unusual in that they were both erected while the New Zealand wars were still being fought. Others were erected later, including a large statue to Governor Gray in Auckland. Gray was heavily involved in instigating the New Zealand wars, and he also instigated a lot of the statues which commemorate those conflicts. Gray himself was a great uh, enthusiast for statues and memorials. And in fact, he believed that we were a new country, quote-unquote, uh, all we had was Māori culture and, and that didn't really count. And that what we needed to do was develop our own history, our own sense of traditions. And that if you went to the old world, you know, there were statues everywhere and they were reminders of the great tradition and the great history. So a new society needed to get to work and start to put up a few figure, you know, heroic figures to provide models and to provide a sense of tradition and a sense of colonial pride. If you look at the statues to the New Zealand wars, the vast majority of them, and the Mutua monument is a a notable exception, were not put up during or immediately after the wars at all. They were put up very much later. And a lot of them were actually put up after the South African war, when New Zealanders had started to get a sense of their sort of... um, proud membership of the British Empire and they were putting up memorials to people who died in South Africa and then they thought, well, who were the first people who died for the Empire in New Zealand? It was actually in the New Zealand Wars. And so there was a whole bevy of memorials that were put up between about between the South African War and the First World War and they were consciously designed as propaganda, consciously designed to provide models of service for the Empire. But George Grey didn't just celebrate the British side of the conflict. He also promoted a statue of Riwi Maniapoto, the famous Kingi Tangarangatira who led the defence at the Battle of Orako. As part of the great New Zealand mythology about the New Zealand wars, which is the idea that through conflict, through battles, the two races, quote unquote, developed a huge admiration for one another. And... George Grey sort of cultivated the idea that once the war was over, and of course once all the land was gone, then he could uh, he could afford to be benevolent with you know the leaders of the of, of the King movement. It was it was part of a sort of romantic ideal that uh, we had our war, but we ended up with the best race relations in the in the country, in the world. Jock Phillips says this era of statue building wasn't just linked to the war. You also started to see a lot more statues and street names celebrating New Zealand's leading politicians and colonists. 
you know, there was one to John Balance put up in the Parliament grounds. There was there was um, one to Seddon that was put up after his death. There were quite a number that were put up around the country to noble pioneers. In uh, Ashburton, for example, there's a very lovely statue to John Grigg, who 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 was a pioneer in um, in uh, South Canterbury, mid Canterbury. So you know, there was a conscious effort to let's people our landscapes with some local heroic figures. And as you say, that time period is interesting because it's around about the time that that sort of colonial pioneer stage in our history has, has come to an end and the people who were part of that are, are now dead or very, very, very elderly. And so this sort of a kind of sense that that part of our history was slipping away and it needed to be memorialised. And it was also a time of sort of burgeoning, burgeoning colonial nationalism, you know, represented, of course, by, by Richard Seddon, by his um, sending people off to South Africa and having great pride in New Zealand's contribution to the empire. Um, yeah, it was a period of, of uh, uh, where New Zealanders thought of themselves as having a distinct role within the empire. They weren't independent of Britain, they were better Britons, and they wanted to proclaim that to the world, and they thought one way of doing that was putting up statues. Of course, one problem was these statues reinforced a mythology that colonisation was a good thing in New Zealand, and even a good thing for Māori. But also, many of the individuals represented have very troubling legacies. John Balance was deeply involved in dishonest efforts to turn over Māori land to white settlers. And Richard Seddon, well, arguably he has the single most prominent statue in New Zealand. It was erected on Parliament grounds in 1915. This is a memorial, after all, a statue that we have chosen to stand in front of Parliament. What could be more expressive that this is the figure we want to represent the country? Now... We need to think about the fact that, you know, Richard Seddon made his early political career attacking Chinese migration. Um, He was a very, very tricky opponent of women's suffrage. His government, you know, grabbed more Māori land than any other government in New Zealand history. Um, You know, there are lots of things we can criticise him for, but he also fought ardently and hard for old age pensions and you know was a stalwart believer that government should should provide aid and support for working people and those sort of values we also need to think about. Seddon's worth discussing a little bit further as Jock mentioned he was a huge figure in New Zealand history he won five consecutive elections before dying in office New Zealand's longest serving prime minister He was widely seen as a champion of the working class. But, as Jock also mentioned, he opposed women's suffrage, alienated Māori land, and regularly gave speeches demonising New Zealand's Chinese community. Calling the Chinese monkeys, you know, nuisance, the peril, and then how the Chinese would endanger the uh, white nation. It was very unfortunate for the Chinese, I would have to say, yeah, that he was such a dominating figure. This is Dr Manying Ip, Professor of Asian Studies at Auckland University. She's written extensively on the history of Chinese New Zealanders. And, as she points out, Seddon didn't just make racist speeches, he also passed draconian laws targeting Chinese people. The most detrimental thing for the Chinese was the 1896 Chinese Immigration Act which raised the protest to £100. So every Chinese who entered the country need to pay £100, a a phenomenal sum at that time, which means that the Chinese have to take out debts and so on before they came. And and he also attempted to pass the Asiatic Restriction Act. It did not become law, only because London refused to give us royal assent. And the the, the Restriction Act is to abolish all Chinese naturalisation. No Chinese could become a citizen. That bill to block Chinese naturalisation did actually end up becoming law after Seddon's death in 1908. It wasn't taken off the books until after the Second World War. But Seddon wasn't just looking to stop new migrants. 
He also made life difficult for Chinese people already in New Zealand. The OH Pension Act of 1898, which sudden you know, passed and which made him the champion of the working men, also excluded the Chinese naturalized or local born from this act. All right. So you know why? Why we all clapped and be very proud that 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 sudden was the champion of the working men. It was working men who were not Chinese. So yeah, Richard Sedden did a lot of good for working New Zealanders, but he also did a lot of harm. And the heroic statue of him in front of Parliament only paints part of that story. Finally, we have to talk about Captain Cook. Today, people have very different ideas of what statues of Cook represent. On the more positive side, people talk about his spectacular achievements of navigation, seamanship and cartography, his leadership and bravery and, according to some historians, his enlightened attitudes towards indigenous people, at least by the standards of his time. On the other side, you can talk about how his expedition shot and killed Māori, often with very little provocation. Like, several people were shot because they were perceived as stealing from the endeavour. At least two people were killed and several more wounded when they resisted Cook's attempts to capture them from a waka. Cook's crew also spread sexually transmitted infections to Māori during his three expeditions to the country. For many Māori, his arrival in New Zealand also represents the vanguard of colonisation and disenfranchisement. It's a complicated story, but it's a rich story. It goes to the very heart of who we are, and it's something we should know about. Getting rid of all the Cook statues is not going to whitewash history. It's not going to change our history. It's just going to mean that people will, will forget it. I mean, I want to argue the other side here for, for a second, which is that statues of Cook are always presenting him as a, as a very heroic figure. You know, they don't discuss the, how many people were shot for, you know, stealing or that were shot because they were trying to row in the other direction when he wanted to capture a few of them. And they don't discuss, you know, the fact that his crew introduced venereal disease. Absolutely. There's no room for these things in, in these statues. No, but there are, there are ways and means of getting that information across, either with other plaques or with a you know a QR code and a you know linking into smartphone and additional information. There are ways and means of putting it into context. It seems to me, and also there are ways of putting up alternative parallel. I mean, there should be a memorial to Tupaya, for example. You know the great. Tahitian navigator, who, who for local Māori was really the, the leader of the, of, the, of, of the endeavour rather than Cook. So, you know, I want to enrich the history rather than destroy it. That's, that's really my argument. Tessa Duda wrote about Cook's first voyage to Aotearoa in her book, First Map, How James Cook Charted Aotearoa New Zealand. It'd be fair to say she's sympathetic towards Cook as an individual, but she still thinks the statues of him in public places are inappropriate. Those statues were done at a time when Europeans, particularly, were busy putting up statues of all their supposedly eminent explorers and discoverers and and, uh, politicians, and they always showed them in a heroic stance. And actually, I would would agree that there is no place for the heroic image of Cook in the public domain, except, as I say, in a museum where it can be put in perspective. I feel I know Cook quite well because I read all his journals and lots of the books that are written about him. I feel I I know him quite well and I cringe when I see those heroic statues and I think he would cringe as well. He was somebody who was, by all accounts, extremely modest, um, horrified that these killings happened on the first voyage so I, I, I would agree that the, um, the heroic pose is completely out of, out of sync with our times. But I think just to sort of throw them in the river, as they want to do with some of them in England, um, doesn't actually address what is the basic problem. And Tessa Duda agrees that memorials to the Endeavour's first voyage need much more recognition of Tupaya. Tupaya's contribution to that first voyage... 
was absolutely undeniable. And Cook was extremely lucky to have somebody on board who could be both mediator and and interpreter. When Cook returned to England with that astonishing map that he created of New Zealand, I think that we should give to Pyre huge credit for the fact that that, was, that map was created. Tina Ngata is a member of Ngāti Parau and was heavily involved in protests against the Tuia 250 events in 2019, which celebrated the 250th anniversary of Cook's arrival in Aotearoa. She believes monuments to Cook and to other colonial figures should simply be removed. You know, it would be unconscionable for people to suggest that we should learn a lesson about what happened in Christchurch by um, last year by putting up a, a statue of the perpetrator. That's the same logic that's being applied when people say, but if you take it, if you don't have a statue to it, then how are we going to learn? You know, or we should have it up just because we should have a statue because it was momentous for good and for bad. And I've heard that said so many times. People say, well, for better or for worse, it was a momentous time that shaped our nation. And that's the kind of logic that you could apply across many places, including um, the, the circumstance that I just that I just provided there. But it, it doesn't wash because the pain is so real and recent and raw that you're able to appreciate how offensive that is. I asked Tina Ngata if she thought these statues could be fixed by adding explanatory plaques or QR codes or by erecting more statues which honour Māori, women and ethnic minorities. You know, there, there's what you say under a statue and there's what a statue says. And regardless of, of what the content is in a plaque, that may or may not be read, certainly cannot be read from the same distance that a statue is seen. You know, we understand, I think, generally, that having a statue up to a particular historical figure, that's an honour. It's it's an honour to be memorialised in your town. And uh, it's still a part of a visual landscape. Ethnic cleansing um, or, or cleansing people off a landscape happens across multiple dimensions and multiple spaces. And one of the ways in which that happens and has always happened is that they remove all visual references to a culture from a landscape, and that's cultural cleansing. We've had that happen here in Aotearoa, where visual references to Māori have been removed and replaced with colonial references. And I don't think you know, having some different writing on a plaque, or a, particularly if it's a Q code, because who's going to pick that up, is going to um, is going to account for that. And as far as putting them in a museum goes, a museum to racists or whatever, I mean, that would be you, you could imagine that would become a mecca for white supremacists to go there and see their heroes. But also, I would find that a deeply disturbing and a depressing place to go to, yeah. Hey, I want to throw one last potential solution and in inverted commas to the statues at you. This is actually my um, one of my own inventions. No one else has suggested this. If we are going to leave these statues up, it should maybe be okay to leave the graffiti on them too and not have that washed up because after all, you know, they're public property and they're therefore should be vehicles for public process, uh, protests. Is that a potential legitimate idea? I think that the graffiti represents a much more bicultural conversation than, than not having the graffiti there. But why do we graffiti them? We don't graffiti them because we want them to remain. We graffiti them because we want them brought down. We, we graffiti them because they are offensive. And why would anybody want to, if they were considerate or compassionate, continue to offend their treaty partners, continue to offend anybody that they care about? Why would they want to uphold systems of supremacy? And that's what it is. It's a, it's a this is, you know, this whole interview, nearly everything that we've covered has been, but what if, but what if, but what if? There's this there's this core resistance to the act of pulling them down. And that in itself is, you know, that's a a application of white supremacy because it's it's using a a default power system that put them there in the first place 
and um, and that favours keeping them up rather than favouring the whole discussion about pulling them down. Tom Rohr does support removing some statues, particularly the statue of Captain Hamilton. He's one of a group of people in discussions with the Auckland City Council about the future of the Nixon Memorial too. But he agrees with Jock Phillips that others can be dealt with by adding context through explanatory plaques and QR codes. He's also a fan of putting up more statues to figures who aren't as well recognised. He's currently trying to erect a new one in Hamilton. I'm involved with a request to the Hamilton City Council uh, for a memorialising of Dame Hilda Roth, who was uh, the first deputy mayor of the city of Hamilton whose work as a nurse and as a, as a supporter of the Māori Women's Welfare League uh, in its early days, and then as a, a woman parliamentarian in, in Parliament. We feel that she's somebody who is worth memorialising. And so we've uh, commissioned a statue for her. And Professor Roa isn't even opposed to erecting more statues of colonial villains – in the right context, of course. The BNZ was considering having a bust of uh, Whitaker and Russell, the founders of the BNZ, and we know that their history is mixed also in, in terms of the role that they played in convincing Gray that an invasion of the Waikato was a good thing to do. I, I made this comment in, in one meeting, yeah, we should do that, and but we should have a pond. And then uh, above uh, Whitaker and Russell, we might have a, a statue of a little Māori boy, and then people can go past the, the busts, put a dollar in a slot, and the little boy can do his business on, on their heads, on their busts. <laughs> Thanks to all of my guests on this podcast, Tina Ngata, Jock Phillips, Manning Ip, and Tom Roa. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That really helps other people find the show. Black Sheep is written and produced by me, William Ray. Our executive producer is Tim Watkin, and our sound engineer is William Saunders. We had voice acting help from Duncan Smith and Colin Peacock. <laughs>